Hello and welcome back to Off Picture Discussions. My name is John Capone. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Matthew Thompson. Matthew is a writer, director, producer. Uh, his latest feature film is a 2B original. It's called Magic Carpet Rides. We have a great discussion. It was good to catch up with Matt. I hope you enjoy. All right, Matthew Thompson. It's good to be with you, buddy. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for, for popping on and uh, joining me on Off Picture Discussions. This new Dude, seems to be to podcast. Uh, thank you. Yeah, seems to be podcast. But, you know, I really see it as, for me, a way to document, you know, where I am in my filmmaking journey. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of my friends, people I've collaborated with or just have, you know, really good friendships with like-minded natures whether they're, you know, writers or directors or producers, um, I really see it like between films, you know, what, what did we learn from the last film? Where are we at now, you know, getting the next film made and really just jo documenting this time, you know, what we're thinking about, what we're, you know, feeling, of, you know, between projects and, and where we want to go with this, with this crazy yeah. career that is filmmaking. So uh, I want to start off by asking you, a question that I've I've found is a good way to was a good way to start. Um, how did you get into filmmaking? And and you know I I know you know a little bit about your backstory of how early it it began. But you know when were you gripped by you know the filmmaking medium at cinema as the the potential of cinema and what attracted you to to want to direct right and direct? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, honored to be a part of this video diary series basically this is a really it's really yeah. smart It'd be cool we look back on this and we're old men someday say where were we when we were in our late 20s doing this thing but um that question is wild because i feel like the older i get the more i maybe have a tendency to turn it into a story you know and it gets a little bit further from what the actual like raw moments were because i remember that I, I was given a camera very classically like by my dad when I was like about nine eight or nine years old um and I had like a I grew up in in like the suburbs on a cul-de-sac and my neighborhood friends were every day after school that's where really life started it was like life started when we started playing after school with the neighborhood friends and, and a phase we got into was making videos and you know, I got the old camera from dad and I remember doing some little stupid stuff. Um, and then he got sick uh, and he ended up spending about six months in the hospital. And I remember my mom uh, was like, t told me to like bring dad's camera to the hospital because it got to the point where he was getting really sick. And she was like, you might want some of these memories for later in life. So I would go and he was in in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he was getting treatment. Um, and I would just like film asking him questions. He was military, special forces, Vietnam, three tours, worked for the CIA for a bit, like a really gnarly life. But since he had me and my sister, that was all behind him. And there were all these stories. And I remember we would like, ask, you know, sitting there with the camera, just like asking him, like super high pitched voice behind the camera, like, dad, what about that one thing? You know, and I have these videos that I actually found somewhat recently, which is very cathartic, but, um, yeah. and, you know, I, I, and he ended up passing away shortly after. And, and again, I was in the funeral and my mom handed me the camera and she was like, if you want to film it. And so I ended up filming his funeral and I have that video too, of like zooming into his wow. casket and zooming into the people giving eulogies. And like, I think there was, it changed from... I liked maybe the fun of creating fun, whimsical universes with my friends, with the camera, and I got a reaction out of people. And then it became like, I kind of almost started hiding behind the camera. I almost started using mm. it to help cope through. Yeah. And I was maybe just going to ask you control. that question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Of course. I had a bit of, of control over it for sure. And a bit of, all right, well, you know, what's happening in front of me is a lot to process, but at least if like, I'm the one that can choose to like zoom into it, or pan, I'm having some semblance of a control here. Like I'm, I'm, at, you know, I'm at least receiving the information the way I want to, because the information is not something I want to be happening. And of course, I'm not thinking this back then. Now, you know, psychologically, maybe that's what a lot of it was. 
but something happened where, you know, he passed away. Um, I would just make a lot of videos. I just got so into it. I was watching like video co-pilot, you know, like I don't know if you guys, Andrew Kramer, shout out to all the kids that grew up on video co-pilot and like just making dumb shit with the neighbors. And then I convinced like teachers in middle school that instead of doing papers for book reports, I could do a video, which they thought that's way more work. Like, sure, do that. And then I could come show the videos to classes and then the classes would laugh. And so I, you know, started getting a little bit of the feedback and, and yeah, by the time I got to yeah. high school, I was, I was pretty, pretty sad on it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I guess that, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. I, I know your dad had passed, but I didn't know that that's that start of, you know, your uh, interest in the frame really like capturing life within a frame was, was that closely linked with it? And I was, yeah, I was just going to ask you like, you know, not to get too psychological or, or therapy uh, related, but we seem to do that on this podcast. I think it's all, it's all life. It's all connected. Um, you know, if that, if that really did help you through that experience and, and to make sense of it, not, not just to cope or hide or, you know, avoid feelings, but to, but I guess you use, used a good word, which is process, you know, because yeah. I think a lot of what cinema is, is it's not, I think entertainment for sure in, in terms of like the industry, na in, in the in industrial nature of it, right. Getting people in the, the theater to, to watch your movie, to, to pay for your movie and to make a career, but it's cinema is, it is therapy. It, it's an art form. It's therapeutic. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it, it shows us not what life is sometimes, but what it could be, you know, the potential of life. T t totally dude. And I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, at least in the work more lately that I've chosen to do, there's not a difference between whatever I'm working through therapeutically, psychologically and the things I'm making. Like they're, they're, they've become, as I'm getting older, way, way more like, you know, I can tell I'm, I'm searching for things through my own work sometimes, you know, um, or I'm just expressing and I'm putting something that's like so far back in my head. I'm putting it like right in front of my face mm. so I can, I can, yeah. I can observe myself. Um, yeah. now like, you know, with that and, and that whole thing, I think what it did is allowed me to frame it. Like I could literally frame the circumstance in a way that, yeah. Because I don't remember it. I mean, I don't remember any of those moments through my eyes, right? I mean, right, I looked at these videos, right. honestly, really recently, like within the last two years. Um, hmm. And it was why It was crazy. Because it, because I, because it was like, I, like, I thought these were, like, I didn't even know these really happened, but these things in, in the camera, it's like, oh, this shit, like, I really did ask, like, my dad, like, I almost got like upset with him because he like said he would who always promised he'd get us a dog, my sister and I, and he never did. And like, I'm in the video camera. He's like sick in a hospital bed. And I'm just like, you know, we're going to get that dog. And you could just see the heartbreak on his eye in his eyes. Cause he knows, he knows he's not going to be, I mean, oh, dude, man. and I'm just like this, like, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not processing the grief at the moment at all. So it was right, crazy. Cause right. I think this gave me a, a place to store it, a container. And then I, and then I'm, you know, grief comes in waves, right. Anyone who's lost somebody, I think it like, throughout life, different milestones happen, different things. And then, and then it comes up on the shore again. Yeah. And it's really cool that yeah. I have those, those memories. And so, and I guess going back before that, my dad is like a huge film lover. And so, you know, when I would mm. be at his house and, and like, he grew up former military. So we were like, at one point living in his trailer on Camp Pendleton on the beach down in San Diego. And like, all we would do is watch movies. So there was also a love language that got developed, I think, between like movies equal an escape certainly particularly through a time okay. when there was just a lot of negativity and difficulty and then it also was the thing that dad and i we would just sit there and watch movies all like all the time i mean i remember he would sometimes be like you're not going to school today we're hanging out and we would just watch movies all day long so i think my love That's for awesome. movies i think it all it's all really tied into that relationship which is wild and I'm, and I'm becoming more aware of that as i get older and it actually informs a lot of like it's 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 interesting so i'm kind of moving up from the point of maybe like i did film for what what got me here was something unspoken unsaid it just felt like i needed to do it i like when i pick it up and when i'm in a circumstance or i see anything in my life interesting i'm always just trying to frame it and i think that came from whatever that early you know interest was and then what came later was all the other stuff like oh 
this is really fucking fun to bring all my friends together to make something yeah. cool. Like, like when you're yeah. directing, you're the host of the dinner party, you know, like, right. you know, I mean, you know, it's, there's nothing really better than like seeing all the different disciplines come together. So for every reason beyond that, I've, I've slowly fallen in love with the, the other aspects and, right. you know, I don't, right. I don't really consider myself much of like a cinephile. Like I think I need to know a little bit more film history than I do because, because cinema, the art wasn't what grabbed me. It was the mm -hmm. act of making a movie. If you know what I'm saying, there's like a, like there was, there's to me, there was a difference, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. And only yeah. now is the craft becoming something. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. No, but I, I agree with that. It's something I've thought about a lot too, of like, do you need to be a, a cinephile to be a great director? And of course there's the examples of like, you know, Tarantino and Scorsese, even Steven Spielberg, Nolan, yeah. you know, they, they have this very high cinema IQ and yeah, there's something to be said to about knowing the tradition of what, be, what came before you and, you know, different styles and even just tracking culture over, you know, the history of culture. Right. But um, I think I think cinema is so much more than just the medium. You know, I really I really do. I think it's and I've been more interested in, I think, probably since since graduating LMU and taking, you know, a, an acting program. I went I went to two years of an acting Meisner program in Santa Monica. And that's where I met my wife, Giovanna, and our story began. Um, it was more about that. That was more about me just throwing myself into acting you know to try to understand dramaturgy more the the rules of drama mm. you know beneath even beneath cinema you know the language of cinema there's the rules of drama and dramaturgy and and i'm more interested in like the literary aspects of you know just telling a story you know um mm. more more than just like big spectacle entertainment now i think it's fun i think that the the tropes and styles of classical hollywood Hollywood filmmaking is, is very fun to play around with and, and, you know, what yeah. you can do, the possibility still out there of, of what can be done, you know, in a, in even a 2d image, you know, um, it's exciting. I mean, what, you know, watching Nolan, you know, what he did with, with Oppenheimer and, you know, what so many filmmakers are doing. Um, but I yeah. agree with you. I think like cinema is more than just, you know, cinema really it's 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 about life and capturing life and i think you see that in like european films and foreign films you're reminded of how expansive you know filmmaking really really can be the possibilities of it but um yeah yeah no that's no it's cool. it's cool and and what i'm finding myself like honestly like in real time kind of forging together is like what maybe was this very authentic very um uh, subconscious process happening of falling in love with capturing life, I'll call it through a camera. And then this, like the films I love that I'd watch all the time by myself with dad were the Spielberg, whimsical, wondrous, awe-inspiring, right. magical. And that's the stuff I love to make. And so there's this kind of like place where I'm trying to take like sort of like authentic life, authentic characters, in my pitch, I tell my managers the kind of movies I want to make is like authentic characters in like high concept spectacle scenarios. And, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, if I'm getting really technical, like that's the kind of thing I'm, I really get so hyped on because I think that's the true blend of, of my love within, within the universe of movie making. Right. I like the magic. I like the wonder. I like spectacle, but I like it to feel like I'm observing something really happening and real emotions and, yeah. Honestly, like if I really break you're, it all down, pitch, it's like you're it's like you're pitching to the audience the possibility of that happening in real life, right? You're reminding yeah. the yeah. audience like that this stuff exists if you if you, you know, have the awareness and the patience and the ability to like wait and 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 look for it in life, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I yeah. you know, and I was reminded of that. I want to talk about uh Magic Carpet Rides in in a little bit, but I was you know, I watched the film, I was very impressed. And I, I, I think it was that which I expected from you, of course, is that marriage of what you said, authentic characters and high concept, extraordinary circumstances brought together. And I, I, yeah. I thought like it was this sort of which you don't see now, a lot nowadays of these rom coms that are, are done in a classical sense, but with a fresh sort of original modern twist, right. And I, I thought you achieved that, you know, with flying mm -hmm. colors, you, you, you brought great performances together and 
the, the, the writing was, was really specific. I felt like it was a, a true reflection of, you know, what it's like living in Los Angeles, being young, trying to find love and still finding, looking and searching and finding, you know, a little bit of magic underneath, you know, underneath the surface of it all. So yes. well done, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the whole team. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you felt that specifically. Cause that was the, I mean, we even had like the composer, Eric Ajo is incredible. He like is ref, riffing off of um, Henry Mancini in the opening, like in the theme song, the Magic Carpet Rides, it's like the Moon River is in, it's like in there. And you, the movie, the music starts off super rom-com classic. It's strings, yeah. it's whimsical. Right. And then at the end, the final score, yep. Yep. you know, in the climactic moment is so stripped away. It's the same theme, but it's modern synth tones. It's like the whole movie goes from this classic romance and then to just, today with people on their phones but that there is still romance even within that it's 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 there and it was a very yeah, yeah I, I noticed that, that. I, I noticed that in the music i was like you know paying attention to the music because i i was struck by oh this feels very i feel like i'm you know enveloped in in a capra world right at the beginning mm. and and then the cool. second half of the film you start to use the, the synthesizers more electronic music and it, it feels like it's more new agey stuff and yeah, by the end, it felt like, you know, this is like a 500 Days of Summer, like indie, you know, the classic sort of indie ending. We're, we're screwed up, but, you know, we still can't <laughs> help but find each other, you know, be together. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that was very cool. That was very cool. I didn't know that was like a sub it was subconscious enough where it didn't call attention to itself, but it, it totally worked yeah. for sure. Oh, well, let's you. get into. Um, so, you know picking up from those formative years now through high school yeah. and maybe into LMU talking about, you know, what made you really want to commit to this is like exploring it as a, as a career path as something that's viable to actually do for a living. I want to chase down my dream yeah. and make it happen. So I, you know, I did two feature films in high school. One was between my junior and senior year. I'm sorry, sophomore, junior year, and then junior and senior year. Um, the first one was called The Medallion of Man, and it was about this medallion, this necklace that uh, – I went to Catholic school. It's kind of a school boy. And, and it was basically – the story is, is God creates the world, and at the time, Lucifer is still an archangel. He's not yet the devil. And God creates Adam and Eve. And I, I literally have like a 10-minute prologue where I filmed like – like people like on a green screen with like altar server robes being like God and angels. I mean, like it was the whole thing. And basically the story goes that God created Adam and Eve, but when he put him down to the garden of Eden, um, Eve was just not interested in Adam, just not down. And like, did, mm. and, and, and God was like, man. And then Lucifer comes along as this archangel saying, Oh, maybe if I can make Eve fall in love with Adam, God will reward me. So he goes down to this fiery furnace becomes hell and creates this medallion called the medallion of man which any guy who wears it any woman that looks at him instantly falls in love with him so he sends it down to earth adam it's finds awesome. it, puts it's it awesome on. high concept film right it. there <laughs> yeah just rewriting the bible real quick you know and then like you know eve falls in love with adam and the medallion gets passed on generation after generation until one day in modern times this kid mike finds the medallion and he's unlucky with the ladies and now he gets all the women and he has to learn, you know, they got to like him for who he is and, and the whole thing. So, um, so that was like, that was, you know, we, we I just grabbed all my friends for a summer and we would like build sets in our garages and shoot with the, the high school's cameras. Um, my film instructor there, uh, Ryan, he became like executive producer on the film and just helped provide some equipment and some, and some guidance. And then, you know, this was like the big sort of, I want to prove that like, I really want to do this. I remember seeing this video from Robert Rodriguez that was like, if you're a filmmaker, you just make a business card that says filmmaker and you're a filmmaker. And he was, and it's called 10 minute film school. I think it still exists online, but he was also yeah, saying yeah. that like, why would you, why would you make short films if what you want to do is make features? You know, he's like, I wanted to make a feature. So I just bootstrapped and did it myself. And I was super inspired by that. So I kind of, same attitude. I was like, let's just do the the full marathon. We premiered it at yeah. a local theater called La Paloma Theater in San Diego. There was like 150 people showed up. You know, the movie's not great at all, but it was like, I'm proud of it for being whatever, 16. But it, what it did was just show the people that I was serious about it. It showed me I was serious. Yeah. It showed my mom 
got her support yeah. in, you know, and then everybody, you know, and then the next summer I did another one called Night Sights, um, which was a little bit more dramatic. It was a sci-fi drama that got picked up for distribution through a boutique distribution company called ITN Distribution, um, sold to a bunch of territories internationally. So That's I awesome. came into to college. Yeah, I didn't see anything from that. I learned also about Hollywood accounting from there where like they had a $25,000 expenses cap and they made exactly $25,000. Right. So yeah, didn't see yeah. anything there. Yeah, anyway, that, that's, I, that's how it goes. No, but but just to make that yeah. step even before going off to college, like being 17 or 18 or whatever you were and, and having that experience, that's, you know, a formative experience. And to what you said of, you know, just, you know, doing printing the business card, putting it in my wallet and I'm a filmmaker, you know, it, it takes that yeah. just just commitment, right? You know, your first stuff is going to suck and you don't know everything. Of course, you can't know everything. And, you know, your creative yeah. voice isn't developed yet. You're only you know, 16, 17 years old, you're only in high school, but, you know, committing, stepping over the threshold and committing and saying, you know, that I'm just not going to stop. I'm just going to always be, you know, working on projects, learning something from the process, meeting people and, and, and honing it, you know, honing in yeah. on the crafts and, 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 and continuing. I had a, I mean, and, and it was also like, uh, I, I was the dumbest, I was the least smart person on the set. So like when Medallion of Man, you know, I was really sheer, sheer, just like excitement was getting the crew together. But the second time around Night Sights, you know, I, I asked the film professor to basically come in and produce it. And, and what he did was he made calls to all of his former students who'd graduated from my high school, who'd gone on to film schools. So our DP, Roland Lazarte, was, a, was an NYU film school guy production manager was from USC props was from Chapman. So it actually became like all these, I'm still, I was a senior in high school that summer, but all the people working the key crew positions were in film schools and they wanted to come back and work on a feature because a lot of them same, like wanted that opportunity equally yeah, for their sure. own career. So I sure. found myself on a, on a set really not knowing uh, a lot about, about the specifics of these roles. I don't think I knew what a gaffer was when I started shooting the film but I learned from these people and I was the least informed person in the crew. But what I knew was just like the story I wanted to tell. And so I really learned right. directing, not by knowing every position first and then starting and then being a director, which is kind of what they teach you in film school. But I learned it by saying, I want to tell this story and I'm learning in real time from each of these positions. And so that film was a real dialogue. It was kind of like, I want to do this thing. And then you'd say, well, this is what we have to do to achieve that thing. And I'd say, okay, all right, well then let's, let's revise that, you know, or like, you know, whatever <laughs> it is. And so when I came, when, anyway, when I came into LMU, I was like, I didn't actually, um, I was not super hyped on wanting to like go to film school. I wanted to just keep making movies because I, I sort of saw, right. oh, like this is a different era. Like this is like, I can put this stuff out online and I, I can make things for cheap. I have the cameras, I have the equipment do I need all this? And I'm really glad I did go to LMU because now 80% of the people I still work with on sets are the crews I met while there. And, you know, I met Matt right. there. We started a film company, Matt Law. We started the mats when, when I was a junior. And so to actually get to your question of like the transition into doing it professionally, like we created a, a company called the mats while I was still in college uh, because we said to ourselves, we don't really want to work for anybody else. Uh, we both had come from very super indie grunt like you do all the jobs you wear all the hats yeah, writer yeah. director editor producers um and so we we were doing commercials to start to just keep the lights on and then we ended up doing debunkers inc uh right after graduating lmu right. uh, for for like no money and then showtime bought that film after that so uh so it was always indie and then from there is actually when i started getting real work all that was just yeah, but that, that's the that's the next phase. We'll we'll go into that next. I yeah. want to ask you a question about because, you know, I I remember I took a class with you and Matt Law. I think freshman year. I think it was. I don't remember whether it was first semester or second semester. I remember what it was. Year, it was prod one eighty. That's right. Prod, prod one eighty. Second semester of freshman year. Yeah. <laughs> Weren't there like yep. two professors? I think there were, like there were. Two one guy was super ripped and he always wore really like tight shirts. I yeah, that's know. right. Yeah, he was like a surfer <laughs> yeah. bro. He had like. Talk about a medallion. I think he had his medallion over his t-shirt, like rock yeah. that look. Had like a, yeah, like a, uh, 
like Keith Urban, the, the country star, like haircut vibe kind of thing going on. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's so funny. And they couldn't be more like opposite personalities, but they, they worked. That was that was a fun class. So you mm-hmm. met Matt Law. I mean, I think we all met each other, but but I, I, yeah. I was like looking behind me. I was like, these two are, are hitting it off. And did yeah. you guys meet in that class? Right outside the door. Like, literally, yeah. I remember, I don't remember meeting a lot of people. And I remember the moment. Matt and Matt. Yeah. It was right outside that door. Vibes. <laughs> Crazy vibes, dude. And then later on, we learned, like, all right, well, first of all, both our names are Matt, which we kind of hated each other for in a way. But then, <laughs> right. you know, but it was like he lost it, his Hey, dad. you know, it's a perfect meet cute situation, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> it was it's meant to be but, star-crossed. <laughs> It was so funny, but yeah, he, you know, I learned later, like, you know, he lost, like Matt lost his dad when he was about the same age as me. And we both knew what it was like to grow up single mom households. And like, there's so much like about life, even though we couldn't be mm. more different in some ways, uh, the way we right. were raised and where we were raised and how we were raised. So weird, like our spirits and our, and like the deepest level of our hearts are like sure. so the same. I mean, he's really like my brother, yeah. like, and so it's really special. So when we got that class was the first project we ever did together. And it was just one of those immediate, like, we are, we, we, we elevate each other. It's like ice climbers mm. and uh, super smash bros. You know, they like, they kind yeah, of both yeah. like sort of like sling each yeah. other up kind of thing. Yeah. He, he became really. And, that, and that was my question about Matt law. You know, what it is, what is it about that collaboration, that partnership when it started yeah. and how it's progressed since that just clicked and, you know, added value to both your, your lives and your, your filmmaking endeavors, you know? Yeah. I mean, he's just, yeah, he's the greatest guy in the world. Like, he's killing it now with his true show, which by the way, I don't know when mm. this is coming out, John, but he's, he's dude been doing this um, traveling. Uh, it's like an immersive cinema night of films and live theater called true. It's five short films he directed and they put on this whole thing. And it's, it's like transformative. Talk about where psychology cool. therapy meets filmmaking dude it's yeah, 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 he's, yeah. he's on some but um, that's awesome I, I gotta check that out i think i saw him post something about that but i didn't know he was traveling is he's he he's doing like an actual like theater tour with that wow that's where it's going yeah so this is all like almost awesome. off broadway like doing it at home working out the kinks too each time like getting yeah you know they're 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 elevating the show in real time and uh and the goal is to yeah be like they're raising money and they want to go completely indie like go travel around and take this uh places which which is again so cool the like indie spirit um right you should have him on That's John. Awesome. but but um yeah anyway sure. he yeah i mean a, a lot of what we did a lot of what we did together that i think worked so well was there was like so much obviously like love and support but there was just this like constant you know i always thought i was like the hardest worker that i knew and matt right thought he was the hardest worker he knew so we would we lived together for for seven years in this yeah. house in westchester which which was awesome and we literally lived like lived you know we, a little closet in between us and our rooms and i remember like coming home and it'd be like 3 a.m and like he's still working in his room and i'm like keep working. You know, wake up early i keep working and like there it's was awesome. just this con i think it wasn't anything that had to be said but it was just by seeing him so devoted to becoming a better filmmaker and i think him seeing me so devoted we just constantly had this like very like we just wanted to keep getting better and then when we'd work together and in our company the mats we usually when we do things under the mats we co-direct it and it's like music we don't really even need to talk about who's doing what it just we kind of right. know what to do and then we go off and we do our own things i direct films he directs things and but the mats is kind of this thing we can come back to and we, we realize when when we put both of us together on a set there's something else special that we both love that's just almost a little bit different. It's almost like just fun playtime, but what comes from it are yeah. things that make us money. Like they work, they, they, you know, they're fun. Uh, there's a good right. blend of the sensibilities. I think where, you know, mm. um, like we're, we're basically, we both love to do things that have a bit of a spectacle to them. that have a bit of a, a magic, a bit of, a bit of a wonder. There's also like, it becomes, there becomes an edge or there becomes something that's a little bit more specific, grounded, deeper when we kind of both put ourselves together. And, and that's honestly what happened to with Magic Harper Rides, you know, having him there. Um, so, right, right. He's, he, well, it looked, yeah. it looked like you guys were having fun, you know, and I, I know, yeah. I know you share that similar sensibility and, 
you know, like you said, with the whole, you know, life situation, life experience, the work ethic, you know, it, it completely makes sense. And I mean, I'm, I'm really excited. It's really cool that you guys met in, in college and that you, you're like mature bandmates, you know, you guys can go away and do your own thing, but always have this, yeah. this special kinship and sensibility together to come back and check in and, you know, create stuff at various points in your life. So it's, it's very special. It's very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So like taking me through, I guess, from, from LMU, obviously, you know, we did short films in L at, at LMU that were, were, were good testing grounds. Um, I know you did w Wild West uh, Fan Co, which was yeah. super fun to watch, you know, took you into the world of a spaghetti Western and just yeah. high production value, you know, super impressive. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I miss that world, dude. I did the deep dive into Sergio Leone and all those things. And I love talk about cinema that like a good western like a, a big epic once upon a time in the west like that still to me has a feel of like i'm watching a movie and that's probably directly again relational to that's the stuff i watched with my dad growing up it was westerns it was war films you know it was stuff like that so being able to do one in college was very much like i wanted to put my own spin on it it, it very much was like of the western genre but it was definitely like a, it's a comedy at the same time um and and like exaggerated tropes i mean the characters names were like betsy spurs and john caboose so it was it was a it was meant to almost yeah. be like an animated film that wasn't animated um in a right, way right. um yeah but that was really yeah, that, that was fun. the first big yeah the first big like uh production i would say where it was 50 people on set and so that that was really cool to to create the family that made that film and i worked with those people for for many many years after that that, that same crew yeah. yeah that's awesome i'm actually going to turn this light on and there we go i got some light back into it um awesome so yeah so wild west fan co and then you met like you mentioned De debunkers inc right out of lmu i guess i'll ask you first like what was your what was your feeling coming out of lmu you know because obviously like being in film school is one thing and graduating from film school is another thing <laughs> where yeah, you're like yeah. It's like finding Nemo and you're, you're at the drop off and it's like, you can never go back to the reef, you know? Well, you can, but you know, you, you really wow. can't. It's, it's time to start a, start a career, go to the open ocean. Um, what were, what were some of your feelings after May, 2016? You know, what, what were you, uh, what were you thinking and feeling? Well, that's so crazy. You said that because, so I made, I wrote another film that I, I actually haven't done anything with called Big Wheel. Uh, right after graduating school that one of the lines in the movie is this girl, Annika, saying to her friends, I feel like I'm at the drop off, like in Finding Nemo, which is wild, John, that you just said that, because I think that's exactly <laughs> what I felt. Uh, and I felt it so much, I put it into a movie. Hey, there's there's some spiritual synchronicity stuff going on right now. My my wife had a dream last night about uh, like our spiritual gu guru woman, and she called her out of the blue today saying i had a dream about you last night and i wanted to check in so there's like Whoa. there's something going on something in the air these these days <laughs> there's something in the air man and and i think when you know you know you're you're right where you're supposed to be when that stuff happens for sure um so anyway that's, that's cool point, i was i was the film was about remembering who you are as a person this main character named Sanica, she she graduates college has a kind of an identity crisis and remembers who she is as a person by all the different bikes she rode, starting with her big wheel as a kid. And, and the story, it's a very coming of age movie. Um, yeah. And so, I, I mean, again, I kind of think I cope with it by jumping right into just writing. I, I mean, I'm just processing in real time the shit through a movie. I didn't do anything with that. I don't really know what to do with it, but it was great. It was a great writing exercise to, to write it. Um, yeah. And then I guess what I did right after that, I mean, Matt and I, the company would have been about a year and a half into it. We were, we were doing everything, man. I mean, like, you know, I tell my students this, I teach a class at LMU um, one night a week, a mentorship class. And what I, what I tell them is like, uh, you're going to like have to do stuff you like don't want to be doing, you know, like in, yeah. in, you know, when we, when we made our production company, we were doing videos that were like, really lame or like, you know, pharmaceutical videos or little commercials. And like, we obviously didn't talk about that, but that's what we had to do quietly, diligently with our heads down to keep the rent paid. And meanwhile, we were spending every waking other moment, putting that 
resources back into the next short film, the next feature, the next project. So we were doing a bit of that at the time. And then Debunkers, after it got made, um, and that kind of originated by, again, the same producer who did Night Sights, my old film professor, Ryan, who became a collaborator and a good friend, called me back and said, hey, I, I have the high school for winter break. I know you just graduated from college. How you doing, Matt? By the way, I have the high school after break. Let's shoot another movie. Um, and that was the that was the creative sandbox we had to play with. Was we Brand. had a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. yep with nine days at a high school, mostly yep. at night. Um, knew I wanted to do like a mystery kind of film, kind of maybe bring in some detective thing, but it, have it be for fam. He wanted a family film, and he was the one putting up the money for it. So, you know, we kind of found a common ground in between there. It was almost like a Agent Cody Banks meets like Scooby Doo. But it was a bunch of um, high school kids that start a business solving mysteries. And then a girl goes missing and is killed at the school. And they actually have to go like solve a real mystery because it's a murder. Um, and it's called Debunkers Inc. And also the whole joke throughout the movie is like they're Debunkers LLC the whole time. And they're more interested in like running a company than actually solving <laughs> yeah. mysteries. And the like yeah. total inside joke there was like Matt and I at the time were like so running our company was like LLC thing, taxes thing, all this stuff. And like, you know, we had to like sweat yeah. through that to actually get to the fun of making the movies. So we right. didn't find out that that found a distribution home until a year, a year later, almost. Um, so it took a year after being completed. Ryan took the film to a couple different sales agents. Prolific Pictures came on board um, and repped the film and they just, you know, what happened between there and getting Showtime is actually kind of a bit of a mystery to me. I just knew, like, they decided to rep the film. A lot of months went by of them trying to get it sold. And then one day I got a call that was like, we sold it to Showtime. They picked it up for two years. Um, modest contract compared to what it used to be, nothing. But it was enough to, like, pay the deferred pay just to the cast and crew, you know, that we all had deals to. And then um, mm -hmm. and they re-upped it again for another two years. And that film, it's like, it's hard, man, because like a lot of these films I like to make, especially that one, it's a family movie. It's it's kind of meant for kids. And so I had no idea really how it got received because, you know, these people, these kids aren't going to like go on IMDb and rate it. You know, my age demo right, doesn't right. do that, right? But Showtime yeah. kept it going for four years on Christmas Eve on Showtime Family Channel. Like that thing was running. So I was like, it must be getting some viewership because otherwise they wouldn't sure. be buying it and they wouldn't be programming it at like, key family moment times in in programming but of course that's yeah. part of the reason of i think the strikes and all that was like we, i don't know the numbers they never got released i don't really know maybe there was some kid in rhode island watching it that really liked it but in general it was <laughs> it was just another another sort of notch on the growth path of okay learned a lot yeah. um i was actually able to take the like craft tools that we all learned in film school and put it into a project because the last big project was in high school. So it was when I knew no craft and the difference between that one and this one was I just knew a little bit more how to like put the camera places and light things. And, you know, Matt was the DP and actually Alex Sharp came in and, and, and came in and he was our, what's in baseball. When you like save a game, you come in and you like pitch towards the, the end of the, the game. Closer. Closer. Thank you. A yeah, closer. Yeah, yeah, closer. Yeah. He, um, <laughs> he came he came in and like Matt because Matt got booked on a Tyler Perry show. So like the last weekend actually Alex yeah, came yeah. in and shot DP'd for for a week, which was really fun to have him. And you know, that's kind I mean, of he's, best. I he's, love. he's got great energy yeah. to be a closer, you know. Just he, just bring he it right was home. Wonderful. <laughs> he was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Alex is Alex is great. Yeah, he I had him on on and we had a good time on this show. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you learned a ton just about, because I remember watching that you had a premiere in I think it was Westwood, yep. um, of, of Debunkers Inc. And I remember seeing that and just being really impressed with how polished it was, you know, a feature mm -hmm. film that, that was, you know, cause it's like so much and it's something I even learned from Neon Bleed, you know, watching Neon Bleed now, you know, removed from it are, are things with, with pacing, you know, I think when yeah, you, yeah. when you could like nail pacing, um, that's really like you maturing as a, as a filmmaker is, is those, mm -hmm. those things that you can't, they're really the intangibles, right? Just a, yeah. a feel for the craft, right? That you have to, you have to work and, and produce so much just to get to that point of, you know, that's yes. what mastery is. It's just, just this unconscious competence, right? 
Um, yes. You're just very fluid with it. And yeah, I, I saw that in Debunker's Inc. It was a super, you know, complete film, unified, cohesive. The pacing was was spot on. And um, mm. yeah, just, just very Im impressive coming out of LMU for, for, you know, your first feature post film school. What, you know, in terms of like from that point on, you know, I assume yeah. that brought, you know, more pitch meetings, you know, people reading your scripts more or you just being, you know, having more traction or momentum for the next project. You know, what what was that time between Debunkers Inc. and now leading up to I think is your next feature after Debunkers Inc., right? Is, is Magic Carpet Rides and technically it's 2050. Yeah. OK, Sorry. yeah. But, yeah, I, what, which I wanted to ask you about, too, is like from, you know, that feature experience yeah. into, you know, now where we are with Magic Carpet Rides and some of the stuff you've done in between that, yeah. that I know is like documentary oriented. You know, where yeah. where was your brain going in those years? Yeah, man. Well, I should say that debunkers actually did nothing like debunkers. All debunkers did was. um give me maybe more um, equity in conversations. Like it was another thing people would say, oh, you made this film on the cheap, sold it to Showtime. You know, it was a, it was a nice one liner. And you know what it's like if you're if you're being introduced to somebody, a lot of times they want to give they want to give you the one liner, you know, and the one liner went from uh, I didn't really have one before, maybe like did features when he was a kid and started a company. Now it was a one liner, made an indie film, sold it to Showtime. It was easy to say, um, but it did not get me any really directly that movie did not get me any new jobs but what it did indirectly was again we just talked about with taste and rhythm and all those things i learned years mm -hmm. worth of stuff by the amount of hours i spent on that film learning pacing learning yeah. things learning the hard way on things you know like learning just again how to guide a team you know how to like see something to the finish line and editing your own work too in a feature is like you know i don't really want to ever do that again be the only editor on it and i haven't the last two features been the editor because that is when it gets like really like there are definitely some people that can do it i think if i ever did it again i'd always want to have an additional editor too just another pair of eyes because that was really sure. hard like sitting in front of all your work and being objective about it and um yeah. and, and not like falling too much in love with it so we did that. So so it didn't get me any immediate jobs, but it got me a lot of uh, growth, confidence, equity in conversations. Uh, not equity. What am I thinking of? Uh, what's the credibility? word? Credibility. Yeah, maybe credibility. Yeah, I'm trying to think yeah. of like value, e currency, make currency. Currency. Currency is a good word, currency. yeah. Yeah, but no, but no, it didn't. And I think uh, that's also, you know, like a, it's not like you make a film and even if the film get sold as you know with neon bleed i don't know if you had people knocking on your door right when that came out but it's like no you got to be like okay on to the next and no one's gonna yeah. give it to me i gotta go reach for it again i gotta go start this whole thing over again take a breath you know and do it again you know so um that's what um that's what happened right afterwards but then you know i kind of went on a very per like i think it was more of a personal journey moment in life because i did go pretty like back to back to back since i was 17 till i was 24 making shit had some real good life growth moments i did like a 10 day vipassana ret retreat which i super recommend for people which was a silent retreat for 10 hours of meditation a day that was brutal i yeah. learned my own mind i learned my own soul a little bit closer i went on a backpacking trip to iceland with some boys and slept in caves and like just kind of did a little bit more like life building for um, yeah. a couple months almost a year and then out of nowhere and i will say this is especially because you like to talk about the spiritual stuff on your podcast like all the really life-changing stuff i've ever done the projects i've like done indie and bootstrapped they've done a lot they did a lot to help me grow but the things that really changed my life it's like they came to it's like i had nothing mm -hmm. to do with it coming they just fell from and this was i was on the meditation retreat i was literally seven days into the retreat and i got a call and like you don't have your phone or anything so i was like in the group meditation with like 100 people eyes closed and one of the uh, group facilitators like comes up and just says and they were like, your mom called. Can you can you come with us? And I was like, oh my god, what happened? 
like something yeah. terrible Jeez. must have happened because my mom's calling me. She knows I'm on this retreat, which she was like very hesitant for me going on in the first place. But I'm like, I, I go and um, on my way down in this golf cart to the retreat center. And I'm like, can you tell me anything else? Like, what happened? And they go, we all we know is your mom, um, Lisa Clifford called. And I was like, man, <laughs> like and Lisa Clifford, who's like my second mom, She's Chris's uh, mom. Chris, my best friend. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. she works in the office with Tom DeLong from Blink One Eighty Two, who was doing this project about UFOs, and she was basically needed to get in touch with me because she was like, the show got greenlit to do this thing to go, ch- you know, basically wow. chase UFOs. Yeah. Um, are you? Can you be involved? You know, and I'm like, yeah. And she's like, okay, bye. And then I go back up and, and, and it's so funny. She's so awesome. But, wow. um, but <laughs> that, so that gave your, to... that gave your brain a lot to, a lot of fodder to chew on in the next few days of silent retreat, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, Oh man. Cause like, you know, I grew up well, again, watching close encounters of the third kind ET, all these Spielberg films. And here I am. And there's like a genuine documentary opportunity to go basically follow a group of people. And we get to, to spend a whole podcast talking about this, John. So I'll like to truncate oh, yeah, it. Yeah. The, I'm sure people have been seeing in mainstream news now, there have been congressional meetings that have to do with U, what they're calling UAPs, which are UFOs, and and basically going up. Military pilots are encountering things that are defying the laws of physics, things they can't explain. That's the surface level. But these guys that worked in different places in government, Tom, basically, rock star, Blink-182, leaves the yeah. band. He's super interested in UFOs. He has the rock star status. So he's able to get really high ranking generals, people on, John the, phone, Podesta, yeah. people on yeah. the phone. And he's just like, Hey, I'm like really convinced this is real. Come be a part of this yeah. entertainment documentary project. Long story short, he gets these people to come out of the shadows from Lockheed Martin skunk works, theoretical physicists, CIA, um, eight like agents, uh, and Lou Elizondo, who's the one that's been on the news a lot lately. Lou's the one that ran the Pentagon program called ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which is the, the Pentagon's $22 million a year black money program that from, I think, 20, 2007 to 2017 mm-hmm. or something like that would investigate military encounters with UFOs, specifically military, and, and, and assess them as a potential national security threat because it's the Department of Defense. They're not scientists going out to try to see if aliens are real. They're like, is this a threat? to America, that there are things flying and interacting with our military apparatus, specifically nuclear missile silos, that we don't know what they Mm. are. Mm. Lou comes out of the shadows, joins with Tom, because Lou needs an audience. Tom's got an audience. He needs to, everybody, it's like this beautiful little Motley crew. Everything is like, comes together. And I'm basically one of, I'm just filming it. Like I got brought on to document and I made this five minute short of one of the missions we went on to go retrieve some supposed materials. History Channel wanted to make a special. They saw this thing. They said, who did the thing? They brought me on to be the camera operator because these guys who were not used to being on camera, we developed trust with each other. And so then I basically spent two years, John, being a documentarian, um, not a director. Uh, I mean, I would direct little things for the company directly, like little videos, five minute things. But I was working on the History Channel show as a camera operator and we flew all around the world. And it was actually kind of funny because I was right back to doing the thing that actually was the first thing I ever did, which was just kind of behind the lens mm. filming shit that I'm like, what? What is going like, on? What is, what is, fuck happening? is happening in front of my lens? Like people <laughs> yeah. saying four hour abduct. These are these are like sober minded 72 year old men who were military veterans whose wives just brought us in and made us cookies. And they're sitting there. We're looking at their medals, their stories in Vietnam. And it goes into like a four hour abduction story, you know, and I'm, and you're just right. sort of sitting there like, and, and this is similar shit to what we would hear from people in Italy, in Mexico, in Uruguay, like right. we went all over. So you're like, these people aren't making it up. What it is, who, you know, jury's yeah, out. Who knows? I'm, yeah. I'm more confused than I was before I started the show. Um, yeah, but anyway. that seems to be like, I, and I don't have much, um, knowledge or, or understanding of, of the subject. Uh, but from what I hear in podcasts and people talking about it, that's exactly what it is. It's like people who start to go down the rabbit hole actually end up having more questions. It's, yeah. it's such an elusive thing, but it's, it's without a doubt, something, there's something there. That's not, you know, the Kubrick, you know, fake the moon land landing thing. Like 
like conspiracy theory. It's it's a thing. There's something going on, you know, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I think I think, yeah, the interest of like why these events or occurrences happen around, you know, nu- nuclear missile silos is really interesting. And, you know, yeah. I think there is some some deeper plan or design that's that's you know bigger higher than our consciousness that's really interesting that i'm sure will reveal itself one day you know and i think that would even be cool for you to be be beyond that project whatever it is however it evolves that that's the dream come true for sure That, that that was the moment where things went from what i thought was just in the realm of fantasy that i wanted to capture crossed over into the world of documentary and um and it was really cool to combine the disciplines because the style and the way we captured the show was, again, trying to be authentic to these characters and realistic. But at the same time, we're talking about we're talking about something absolutely science fiction, well, supposedly, but now it's science fact. Um, so like two years yeah. between 2018 to 2020, up until COVID, was dedicated yeah. to to the stars to doing this UFO show. And I met some amazing people. Lou's still a good friend. I mean, I I met some incredible individuals and learned what it was like to sit across from somebody who experiences something extraordinary and what it does to change your life. And that's like a universal Mm. message. That can be PTSD in any form. And these are people that genuinely experience something and their lives change because of it. So a lot of what I'm writing now is a direct emotional response from Mm. me as a storyteller to a lot of those stories that I, that I saw. So, um, yeah, Yeah, no doubt. I mean, right, right. Yeah. And I I think there's something to be said, you know, I think we get so caught up on labels, whether we, we say religion or spirituality or whatever, these profound experiences that really do shape our lives. And it could be something as universal as the, the death of a loved one, or it could be, something as strange and supernatural as, you know, whatever these occurrences or encounters are, or, you know, you take it into the realms of psychedelics, people have these awakenings on psilocybin or whatever. I mean, these are, these are experiences that they, they do shape you, you know, and I think they, they unlock, which is always fascinating to me. And I think I try to weave this into my, you know, script concepts and projects that I'm kicking around in my head are, you know, the deeper layers of what's here, what's already here, you know, we don't need to manufacture technology, we don't need to necessarily go to, you know, the the deepest reaches of space to find this stuff, this is here, but but they're, but they're hidden, you know, latent layers within the human reality, the human experience that are are still to be explored, and whatever that interaction is with the divine, if you want to call it that, or the universal Mm -hmm. energy field, I think there's, and, and you do it in your films, you know, um the, the magic beneath the surface you know what's in between the moments that's that's really making yeah. it happen um and that takes yep. us to you know i know we gotta i don't want to keep you too long i, I want to hit on um magic carpet rides before we before yeah. we go you know what and we could talk i do want to hear about this food documentary too but i think we're gonna have to save that to the to, to round two um cool. but what what took you into magic carpet rides? I know you collaborated with uh, Nikki Dubois on the script, I believe, yeah. you know, and it was, it was a to be original too. So take, take yeah. me through, you know, how that project, the conception of that project with Nikki and then, you know, how, how you got it set up at Tubi. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was one of those projects that in a way was like 10 years in the making and, and what it was, mm. was, the first collaboration that actually Nikki and I ever did together was freshman year of college doing, you might've been in that class with me too. A pro, it was Prod 200. And I, I made this film okay. called Love in Leo's World. And it was a short film uh, that was based off of a feature that at the time I had written called Hashtag Romance, which was a high mm. concept, like rom-com basically about mm-hmm. a guy and a girl that decide to have a relationship without texting social media and travel an old fashioned courtship in the modern world. And I wrote it as a freshman and I spent a ton of years trying to get it made. And that short film that I did that was a little slice of it was the first thing Nicole and I ever collaborated as actress director on. And Mm -hmm. also Matt, Matt Law shot it. He was the DP on it. Hmm. Fast forward 10 years, just about. And I really tried to get that made at the time. But, you know, I was, what, 16? What are you? Freshman year of college. I forget how old you are. 18? Um, Yeah, 18 or 19, yeah. So the concept and the characters were something interesting, but you know, the script was, yeah, it was 18. Um, 
and fast forward, you know, kind of put the, the script in a drawer for a while. Um, you know, Nicole and I and Matt, we had all collaborated on a bunch of other stuff since then. We all did the bunkers together, a bunch of things. And then, you know, Nicole started doing a lot of TikTok work and she started getting like a lot of great momentum and traction doing her own comedy, mm -hmm. ori original comedy sketches and stuff she did on TikTok. And she got approached by, I think it was somebody at Hulu who had said, hey, do you have any feature work, like like a rom-com? Mm. We'd love to see you in a rom-com, anything you've, you've done. And so she calls me and she goes, man, do you have a rom-com? You know, something we can do together. <laughs> and I was like, well, what about the first thing we ever looked at, to, we ever worked on together, hashtag romance, way back when? You know, I think the characters are still relevant, but Nicole yeah. was a social media influencer. So instead of what I had written way back when, which was just, I think, you know, a young woman that was addicted to her phone, like a classic, just like right. millennial. Now it was the, oh, the 1.0 version of that, that archetype, right? Yeah. Now, now we're the like five, five point <laughs> influencer. Yeah. Now there's like a real, now there's a real thing. And now there's like real human emotion attached to this idea of like, as yeah. an influencer, there's social anxiety that comes with it. There's, there's all kinds of identity things. There's, there's so much rich, like there's a whole thing that basically, that basically happened in real life from the moment of conception of these care of this scenario, I should call it right to reality. Right. So, so Nicole and I decided to do like a page one rewrite and pretty much we just kept the concept of guy that does not have phone kind of a Luddite kind of lives in his own fantasy world of olden times. Um, mm -hmm. And girl who is now a social media influencer, which would be played by Nicole. And so, you know, we wrote this film together over, over, I don't know, maybe about four or five months um, we developed it alongside this guy who I think first had been the one asking for something, um, at, at Hulu, who was great and really helpful. But then it, it got to the point where the script was almost done. We were really happy with it. You know, there was really a great convergence of skill sets because I think the theme characters world, you know, that for so long I've been wrestling with met this like amazing dialogue, comedy specificity of characters that Cole's so good at. So yeah, it really became yeah. like truly just a much better version the, the true like a really good product and um but we sort of looked at each other and it was like well this can go into the pile of hulu development or any other studio and almost certainly i won't be able to direct it you know and almost certainly it's going to take years because there's a-list writers and a-list people who have scripts on top of the same pile you know so then we kind of looked at each other and we said well what if we just actually try to get this thing made you know not in the path of just that way but actually try to get it made using things that we have in our immediate sphere so we yeah. spend some time thinking about who could finance it what could happen and then basically uh, a friend of our a friend of of ours all of us basically i met this guy stan spry who's also a friend of nicole's and he's a family friend but i met him through tom delong um mm. when i was doing all the ufo stuff because stan and tom were producing a film together and they were also friends mm. stan is a producer who owns um, cartel entertainment, cartel picture. He, it's basically a bunch of different businesses under the cartel, which is not that cartel. This is cartel. Yeah, a cartel, cartel. A and actual, actual yeah. cartel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and Stan and, you know, Nicole had told Stan about it. I told Stan about it. And Stan eventually read the script in this pitch that this deck that we created about the movie and the angle yeah. into it was that some of the cast members were going to be actual social media influencers. A lot of them, Nicole's friends who could play some of these roles and they all had built in audiences and following. So it, it made, you know, the deal look sweeter and, and look like something that was like, again, you, you need the thing that's like the one sentence that whoever's the person showing it to the person, you know, there's an angle on it. And so it was enough to get Stan to be like, I love this. His company loved it. And he had a deal with Tubi at the time. So his production company had a deal with a bunch of different distributors. He makes like 60 movies a year. He's a powerhouse. And wow. Tubi was one of the deals he has. And Tubi Originals was looking for kind of fresh romance mm. things in this genre. He showed it to them, pitched it to them, and they loved it. Greenlit the film. And cool. what was crazy, John, is what took maybe 10 years from conception to actually getting the script that was right. Yeah. From the time we pitched that script to it getting greenlit was like two months. And then wow. three months yeah. after that, we were in production. We're talking about January of 2020. Yeah two and we mm -hmm. were in production i met with you in between we were in production that june right. and we had 14 days to shoot it 
and yeah yeah i believe it yeah, I'm go- I'm yeah going that's, on and that's on. how I, fast I it can go no 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 yeah. that's that's how fast it can go i think that's you know what's what's so interesting about you know this this industry and you mentioned it early on it's like you you've discovered and I, I was gonna jump in and just echo that point it's like as you as you work on films build a career in filmmaking you realize it's more about doing the act of filmmaking with the right people and the people that you yeah. love and have fun with and get to create these experiences and, and, and foster creativity with then about the actual stories. Yes. The stories are important and you know, they're burned into celluloid or on digital these days and, and they stay around and, and, you know, you can go back and revisit them and think about those concepts or ideas, but um, it's really, you know, the, the journey of the filmmaker is making movies and making movies yeah. with great people and, you know, it's it's just crazy how that that timing thing can work and that synchronicity and things can get going really fast or they take very a, a very long time. And there's a lesson in that, too, of, of, yes. of perseverance and really, you know, standing behind your story and, and seeing it through. Um, yeah, it's 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 all it's all good stuff, all part of the mix I, of of this experience. Exactly. And if I were to look at it, I would be like that movie would have been it became richer because like wine, it aged. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. Like Nicole, Nicole was an influencer. She lived a life with such rich things to draw upon that made Tally, sure. that character so much more dynamic and, and relatable than what was maybe um, an idea of a character that I had at the time. Yeah. Where that, and that person even exist back then. So it was like, you know, sometimes it was easy to be frustrated that nothing was happening with it for so long. And then when something does finally happen, I really do believe you, you, you start to see, Oh, that, that timing was actually was perfect. It was exactly what it needed yeah. to be. And you start yeah. to have a little bit of grace after that about projects. You start to realize yeah. it's really Rick Rubin yeah. talks about this a lot in his, in his creativity mm. book. I forget the name, but like, you're not the mm. one that has all the power to control a lot of these things. Oftentimes, like you, you are the vessel being used by something yeah. that is, that is, that is far grander, bigger. And you're right. You just have to have the like patience and to, and, and it's, it's kind of like a persistent patience, you know, there's a, there's yeah. a weird kind of like how to do both at the same time. I mean, obviously we had to kick it into gear, but yeah. anyway, no, so, no, I, yeah, I, I think got- you're right. I, I think, I think that's exactly what it is. I think it is like this Zen quality of the less you do, the more you create yourself as, or, or build yourself into this, this attractor field, you know, when you, yeah you know, calm yourself when you stop talking, when you open your ears, when you listen, when you look, when you see, you, see, you actually see things, you actually hear things and you're able to, you know, maybe, you know, take advantage of more moments in, in a good way, you know, yeah. um, lean in, say, say the thing that maybe you wouldn't have said if you weren't really listening or paying attention and that sparks someone's idea to, Oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta reach out to this person. Cause this, this person said something about an idea a script, and and that might work it's like again those like in between moments is where is where the magic happens and the patience to to let them unfold i think that's that's really what it's about for sure for sure well that seems like a good note to end on (laughs) i love it yeah man yeah i listen i appreciate you coming on I, i appreciate talking film with you and talking life and uh it's good for good to hear from you what what do you have in the works right now I guess this this is the right way to end it. Is is what's next? Yeah. What's next for Matt Thompson? Well, first of all, I super value you being able. To, you know, thank you for even letting. Me, I feel like even in talking about some of this stuff, there's that there is that therapeutic kind of a, and like a oh yeah, like okay, interesting. Like, you start can you can see your own life again. You're 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 revealing yourself to yourself when you give people the chance to do this. So thank you for the platform. I appreciate it. Um, coming up next, yeah, of is, course, I've been in a big a big writing phase. Um, I got a monster movie. It's an original idea that I came up with called Paranormia that I'm in Ooh. the one of the final drafts, almost done. I'm doing it for some producers out of Atlanta. Um, that's coming soon. Uh, the, I mentioned um, a, the UFO thing that uh, I've been p- toying with since the show. So once this project's done, that's the next writing project I'm diving into. And then Food 2050 cool. is supposed to be coming out this next spring is the, the hope. So we got... Um, an A-list talent that just gave confirmation the deal's being signed now. The, my voice has been the, the voiceover so far. We've been waiting on getting the right talent involved. Oh, wow. So 
fingers yeah, crossed. Cool. Um, I'm not going to get too excited till I'm in the room. But uh, if that all <laughs> goes well, then uh, we'll get the voiceover in. That's the A-lister. And then the distribution is hopefully to follow next spring. And so Food 2050 should hopefully be coming out in 2024. Nice, man. Nice. Industrious yeah. as ever. I, I expect nothing less. I, I wish you uh, the best of luck and success on, on these next endeavors. And man, Thanks, I look man. forward to, to talking soon. We, we'll definitely have to do a round two. We got to do a round two. We got to do that director drinks one more time too. We got to get all the indie <laughs> directors together. Maybe that awesome. one, maybe that one first. The director's drinks yeah. first. <laughs>